This was a discussion or a quote from Andrew Rogers that me and Sherry watched. Um, who here likes to be a problem solver? Raise your hand. Ethan, do you like to be a problem solver? Sometimes, right? Okay. Yes, sir. I can attest to you after many years, almost a decade of going through secular psych psychology and therapy, that is what they try to do. They try to make you bring your problems so it looks like they are solving. Took a lot of a lot of prayer and a lot of people around me for me to finally go through biblical counseling to figure out that biblical counseling is is the is what works for issues and for uh, things of that nature. So tonight's class, if you didn't read the email, um, and if you want to open up if the first page, I'll kind of give a, a brief explanation. Um, this is about a 45 minute class. So I'm going to try and give a, a lot of information on biblical counseling training. So as you see on the, on the front page, it says track eight trials and suffering is the first class of track, uh, track eight. This class is done by Miss Emily Conrad. I did not do this class. Um, she has put an immense amount of work into this it's all their research even though there's multiple different biblical counseling trainings out there this is solely in the grace uh grace biblical counseling um and training with oic which is overseas and in instruction committee or uh, so and andrew rogers is is over that so this this all of this material has been looked at approved for um acbc uh, certification as you take this class so please do not think that you're here tonight and you're getting a class way at the end because because you really and truly this class could fall anywhere um but it is like the catch-up it is it is all of these issues that biblical counseling training, all of the mandatory issues that they have to train on, anger, fear, worry, anxiety, marital problems, the roles of husband and wife, biblical sexuality. This is like the catch all to say trials and suffering, to explain it biblically so as a counselor or as somebody that's coming alongside some someone we're not trying to solve their problems we're trying to walk along with them and point them to the problem solver to make them realize what's what is god actually doing what what is actually going on while they're going through a trial or while they're going through suffering So go ahead and turn to that first slide. Se second one, actually. And it says, why is there suffering? We will start the class. Prior to the fall, Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world without trials and suffering. I'm going to pause there. Who can imagine a perfect world without trials and suffering? Okay. Who's ready for a world without trials? Perfect, everybody. <laughs> All right. However, after Adam and Eve ate from the tree from which they were forbidden to eat, their perfect world changed. So how had their perfect world changed? Adam and Eve were now forced to find their own food and shelter. Adam had to fight weeds and thistles to work the ground. Eve had to suffer in childbirth. They both became aware of their nakedness and experienced shame for the first time. Basically, the consequences of the fall resulted in a change in the way the natural world works. Through their disobedience, 
Adam and Eve had introduced sin into the world, causing the earth and all its inhabitants to be under sin's curse. When sin entered into the world, it brought God's judgment and the punishment of eternal death on mankind. So instead of living in a perfect world, trials and suffering are now a part of life. However, the most devastating consequence of the fall was that now man, who is designed to walk with God in unbroken fellowship with him, had fallen from that exalted position. Instead, he was doomed to live in a broken state, in a broken world, apart from ongoing communion with God. However, in addition to pronouncing the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin, God also promised that the seed of the woman would one day save mankind from the eternal consequences of their sin. But the temporary earthly consequences of sin still remain. In other words, we will now experience pain, suffering, and toil in every aspect of our lives. As descendants of Adam, we too now enter a world separated from God and are by nature children of wrath. Scripture tells us that as a result of the fall, mankind now stands as a guilty sinner. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. The fall and its consequences are, as well as the redemption and reconciliation of all things, lie at the heart of the gospel message. Even being a disciple of Christ does not make us immune to life's trials and tribulations. But even though we still suffer under the curse of the fall, we have the hope of eternal salvation. Our salvation is in calling upon the name of the Lord and trusting in Jesus, Jesus' perfect sacrifice for our sin. Even though the consequences of the curse surrounds us, we eagerly await the final redemption when Christ returns to earth. Amen to that. Romans 5, verse 10 through 11 says, For in while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only through this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. One of the first things that we do in biblical counseling is to make sure that we are counseling a believer. The second part right after that is to along with it is to make sure they understand where sin came from, why it's here. There are different belief systems that think original sin or originating sin didn't come or wasn't from Adam. They think that they can still work and be a good person. And now they've got all these issues and they want these little issues fixed. Go ahead and turn to the next slide. Trials versus temptations. In order to have a better understanding of how to respond to suffering, it is important that we understand the difference between trials and temptations. The biggest difference between trials and temptation is where they originate from. Trials originate from God and are used for our good. James chapter one, verse 16 through 17 says, do not be deceived, my beloved brother. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Conversely, temptations originate from the devil and are used for evil. James chapter 1 verses 13 through 15 says, No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has run its course, brings forth death. This verse clearly tells us that God cannot tempt anyone. Based on this, it is extremely important that we learn to distinguish between trials and temptations. First, let's talk about trials. Trials can create a huge obstacle for us. They can be such things as a job situation, a medical issue, financial difficulty, marriage problems, and so much more. However, even though these trials may create a huge obstacle for us, God promises us if we respond biblically to the situation, he will use it to further conform us to the image of Christ. The Bible gives us numerous examples of individuals who went through trials. For example, Abraham and Sarah encountered a huge obstacle when they had a difficult time conceiving a child, even though God had promised them that this would happen. In the Gospels, there are many examples recorded of people who had huge medical issues such as blindness, lameness, or sickness, but Jesus healed them. However, we must remember that not all obstacles are removed. For example, Paul had a thorn in the flesh that was not taken away. So God decides how he is going to use the trial that he allows into our lives. Whatever trial he allows into our lives gives us an opportunity to trust him more. Temptations, on the other hand, are used by the devil to distract us and lead us into sin, which will ultimately lead to physical and spiritual death. In other words, the devil uses temptations to trip you up and destroy. We are tempted when the enemy entices us into sinful behavior. Temptations can come from the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world and our flesh tempts us with, god with godless value systems and material things. And of course, 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He is very cunning and is able to work directly against us as well as indirectly through the world and our flesh. He puts simple choices in front of us, knowing that if we follow them, they will impact our faith and our effectiveness as a witness for Christ. Temptations can be compared to a fork in the road where we are forced to make a choice regarding which road we are going to take. One road is a sinful choice, while the other road is a biblical choice. In other words, it is an opportunity to sin or to not sin. For example, do you take a second look at that beautiful woman or handsome man? Or do you look away? Or what is your reaction to the person who just cut you off in traffic? Which happens all the time. Do you respond in anger or do you extend grace and forgiveness? When we are faced with temptations, we must remain on guard and use the power God has given us to destroy the plan that the devil has to distract us from God's plan for our life. The Bible gives us examples of those who were tempted and gave into the temptation, as well as those who, who were tempted and resisted the temptation. For example, 2 Samuel 11 records that David gave in to his lust when he engaged in an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. He then suffered the consequences of his choices. However, Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11 records how Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, but did not give in to the temptation. What did Jesus use to rebuke the devil? Scripture, God's word. That is trials and temptations. Let me turn to your next slide. How to respond to trials. So now that we know the difference between trials and temptations, 
it is important to know how to respond biblically to each. So this is where you're, you, you've assessed the situation, you're gonna work with them now, you're gonna try and keep them pointed to God and, and start working on things of capturing their thoughts and how to humble themselves and point it towards God. The first one is expect trials and suffering. First Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. We must expect suffering because God says in his word that we will go through suffering. Therefore, we must not be surprised by it, but rather expect it. Since God uses trials to test our faith, we should not be caught off guard when they happen. Number two, know God's word. In order to respond to trials biblically, we must know God's word. Therefore, we must study, meditate on it, and treasure the promises of God's word. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We must arm our, ourselves with the sword of the spirit to fight the battle, battle well. For our battle is spiritual and requires weapons of the spirit. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 12 and 17 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit sword of the spirit which is the word of god c remember the goal of trials the goal of trials is twofold first romans 8 28 tells us that god works all things together for good does that mean that it's all good at that point in time but he's working it together for our good. This means that God is in control of all circumstances that come into our life. There are no accidents. So what is the good that trials brings? Romans 8.29 tells us that the good is that we become more conformed to the image of Christ. So trials allows us the opportunity to live out our faith. The second and most important goal of trials is to bring glory to God. Satan challenged God, who was bragging on Job and said, you bless him, and that is why he follows you. But Job, even after all the calamity that hit him, continued to worship God. This proved that Satan was wrong. A few times in our mind and Sherry's marriage counseling, providing marriage counseling to, to someone. This is the first set of verses that we come to. They're obviously coming with issues, with problems, with life dominating sin. There's unforgiveness, there's bitterness, there's anger, there's wrath, there's malice and slander. It's always They've done too much. How can I ever forgive them? Why is all of this happening? Let's go to Romans 8, 28 and 29. After we solidify that they are believers. Why? Because I got to step off with them understanding that it's all working for their good so that they can glorify God. And it takes a couple of sessions sometimes to really get that in to make them think this this can't his his alcoholism cannot be good it just it just can't yes it is you just have to figure out and and walk them through and explain 
keep focused on God and watch him do the work. In 1 Peter 4.13, it says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also the revelation of, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may also rejoice and be overjoyed. So for those who have trusted God, they will reap an eternal reward that is waiting for them. So it is important that we remain, that we maintain a heavenward focus. D, pray for perseverance and wisdom. We must call upon the only one who can sustain us during the midst of our difficulty. James chapter one, verses two through eight says, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that person ought not expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Remember that it is the testing of our faith that develops perseverance. Furthermore, this verse tells us that we are to ask for wisdom as we are going through trials. Trials are used by God to test and grow our faith. Therefore, they require faith and patience. So we must have patience when we are going through trials so that we can be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If we do not exercise patience during the trial and don't believe that God is going to do what he promised, we will end up with our faith in the same spot it was along with our situation. In other words, if you ask God for what you need in faith without doubting, you will grow in your faith in accordance with God's will for your life. It is through perseverance that we receive the blessings that God has promised. James chapter 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trials. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Look for reasons to rejoice. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18 says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. However, most people's natural reaction to suffering is to feel sorry for themselves and or complain about the situation. This shows that we are focused on ourselves rather than focusing on the Lord. Also, Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Remembering God's blessing can help us in keeping the right perspective while we are going through a trial. So we are to rejoice in our suffering because it is, a, it is through this suffering that we experience a small portion of the bitter cup Jesus endured when he was hung on the cross for our sins. The next one is my go-to, personally. Stay others focused. This is going to work a lot better if you're other, others focused ahead of the trial. During a time, our times of trials, we are to stay focused on others. Even during these difficult times, we are to fulfill the commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. We have a tendency to believe that our situation is more difficult than anyone else's. However, in 1 Peter 4, 19, we are told that in the midst of our trial, trial we are to stay others focused. That verse says, so then, 
those who suffer according to God's will should commit this themselves to their faithful creator and can continue to do good. In other words, suffering does not exempt us from doing good for others. The last one on your page, seek encouragement and or counsel from other believers. Galatians 6, 2 says we are to bear one another burdens. This mean that, means that God does not mean for us to endure suffering on our own. Exodus 17, 8 through 11 tells us that when the Israelites were fighting, fighting Amalek, they were only victorious as long as Moses was raising up his arms. But he grew weary in the battle and needed the help of Aaron and her to hold up his arms when he lost strength. Also, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. Getting counselees, obviously they've come for help. Getting them others focused is hard. Getting them to rely on the church family for continued um, accountability and continued encouragement is the second hardest. There's a big wall that has to get broken down inside of the counseling room, the counseling room. Some of those walls have already, the, the relationships have been set. They have, they have a Paul, they have a Barnabas, they have a Titus, they have other people that they can rely on while they're going through this trial. I have not figured it out yet, but so many people want to suffer alone. Don't know why, but a lot of people, a lot of Christians want to suffer alone. So I'll let them, especially, I know not everybody here wants to be a biblical counselor, but we are called to come alongside and when we see somebody suffering, be intrusive. That's that's the main thing is how can I pray for you? How can I help you? How can I come alongside? So now, how to respond to temptations. We need to consider the following when responding to temptations. We respond to temptation by putting on the whole armor of God. Ephesians. Chapter 6, verses 10 through 18 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up, I'm, I'm going to change that because this is a different translation. It, it, it's supposed to say, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, praying at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. 
So let's look at the different parts of the armor and what they mean. The belt of truth. The first element of the armor is truth of God's word. We must view everything through the lens of scripture. The breastplate of righteousness. The righteousness referred to here is the righteousness of Christ imputed by God and received by faith with which guards our hearts against the accusations of the devil and secures our innermost being from his attacks. Feet prepared with the gospel of peace. We know that the devil places many obstacles in our path to try to halt the gospel message. So we need to prepare our feet for the dangerous obstacles that we will encounter on our path to advance the gospel message. Shield of faith. The devil continually tries to place doubt in our mind about God's faithfulness. Scripture clearly testified about the faithfulness of God. Helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is our belief that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. Our belief in the gospel message helps us reject false doctrines. The unbeliever, on the other hand, has no hope of warding off the blows of false doctrine because he is without the helmet of salvation and his mind is incapable of discerning between spiritual truth and spiritual deception. My favorite, sword of the spirit. This is the word of God. While all the other parts of the armor are defensive, the sword of the spirit is the only offensive weapon in the armor of God. It's the only offensive weapon we need. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, the word of God was always his overpowering response to Satan. In addition to wearing the full armor of God, we are also told to pray. Without prayer, without reliance upon God, our efforts at spiritual warfare are futile. Through the full armor of God, along with prayer, we can spiritually, we can be spiritually victorious and overcome the devil's attacks and temptations. We'll go to the next slide. Now let's talk about how God uses trials. Some people believe that God wants our lives to be easy and comfortable because he loves us. Does anybody believe that? <clears throat> this is just not true. The Bible clearly teaches that God loves those who are his children by working all things together for their good. So working all things together for good includes the trials that he allows in our lives. So God uses trials for the following purpose to develop godly character. Romans chapter five, verses three to five tells us that our trials bring about perseverance and, pers and perseverance proven character and proven character hope. Our character is influenced and developed by our choices. We develop godly character as we identify the sin in our lives and replace our simple behavior the place our simple behavior with the appropriate biblical principles. Let, let me pause here so I can try and, and, and make this a little bit longer. What's some appropriate biblical principles that you can think of? If I had to reword it, I'll, I'll reword it. But what would, give me an example of an appropriate biblical principle. Good. So love. What if I change that to the appropriate biblical fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Awesome. So this is in developing godly character. This is where you start introducing the fear, ang fear, anxiety, worry or foolishness, anger, 
wastefulness, you just whatever you want to call it, whatever they're dealing with, somebody's angry and has an anger problem. Maybe we need to change and show them in scripture that they need to work on patience or on kindness or self-control. Somebody who's worrying all the time. Love. Peace. So that's where take the sin and match it with scripture. Not with cognitive behavior therapy where they're going to say, take your stinking thinking and turn it into flowers and rainbows. Take all those bad feelings that you have, uh, everything that's happened in your past, put it in a little prison cell inside of you and lock it and throw away the key. It doesn't work. Have to replace it with a biblical principle that's outwardly focused. Because obviously, if you're angry, you got to be angry at somebody. If you're worrying, you're worrying about something. So develop that godly character and point them to scripture that pinpoints the opposite for that simple behavior. Next, to prove our faith. First Peter chapter one, verses six through seven says, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which perishes, perishes though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, our faith is validated and tested by the trials we go through. As a result, our faith is even made even stronger. This is one of the verses that we will point people to when they're going through a trial or suffering for them to remember. Why? Because it will cut to them to show what is the purpose of this trial. To increase, improve my faith. Next, to get people's attention and teach them or others something. Trials and sufferings are the result of living in a fallen world. Therefore, a lot of our suffering is caused by our own sinful choices. Smoke for 30 years and you might have COPD or cancer. Drink for twice that, may have liver problems. However, we must not make excuses for our suffering if it is a result of our own wrongdoing. A lot of times, I'm sure we've all heard, well, it was the way that they were raised. His dad was an alcoholic. His mom smoked. Can't blame them for how they're acting. Oh, yes, we can. Yeah, they may have had a bad upbringing, <laughs> but we can point them in the right direction of biblical correction instead of letting them be stuck on worldly passions. First Peter chapter four, verse 15 says, make sure that none of you surf, suffer, suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. God will certainly forgive our sins because the eternal punishment for them has already been paid by Jesus's death on the cross. However, we will still suffer the natural consequences of our sins. But God can even use those sufferings to mold and shape us for his purpose and our ultimate goal. If our suffering is a result of our own sinful choices, we must repent of our sin and ask for forgiveness. However, Satan is also continually working to entice us to sin. Even though we are in a spiritual battle, Satan does not have any authority over us as believers. To fight these battles, God has given us 
his word to light our path, the Holy Spirit to enable us, access to the throne of grace at all times through prayer, and the assurance that he has overcome death through his death on the cross. Make a little point here for all my parents. Does it mean for you to withhold discipline? If your kids are suffering, that's not what this means. You apply the correct amount of appropriate discipline, even though they are forgiven, but the discipline will grow them. D or next, to reveal what we really love. Luke chapter 14, verse 26 says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. God tested Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his son as Isaac. The birth of Isaac was the long-awaited fulfillment of a promise that God had made to Abraham. Then after the fulfillment of this, this problem, this promise, God asked Abraham to sacrifice him. But Abraham responded in obedience to what God had told him to do, to do, believing that God could raise even the dead. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac and the only and the one who had received the promises was offering up his only son. It was he to whom it was said, through Isaac, your descendant shall be named. He, could, he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. Genesis chapter 22 verses 11 through 12 says, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him, from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. To reveal what we are trusting in. We can endure the severest of trials if we trust God. We cannot choose whether we will go through trials, but we can choose how we will respond to them. Therefore, it is important to look at our trials through the lens of God's word. It is because of his attributes, his promises, and his purpose that we can endure. As a matter of fact, we can, we can consider it all joy when we encounter various trials. As it says in James chapter 1, verse 2, if our perspective is right, going through trials gives us an opportunity to humble ourselves and remember that we must not depend on our own strength, but rather we must depend on the grace of God. God uses these trials to continually remind us not to trust and pursue worldly things because this world is not our home. In this fallen world, we must accept trials and suffering as a part of life. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 tells us that God's ultimate purpose is to conform us into the image of his son. The trials we go through are designed to enable us to reach that goal. Being set apart for God's purpose and glory is part of the process of sanctification. However, Christ is going to replace all things that have been tainted by sin. Currently, the world groans under the curse of sin. However, when Jesus comes for all those who have trusted in him, God will restore all things. Acts chapter 3, verse 21 says, Whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. He will create a new heaven and a new earth 
to replace what was destroyed by sin. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there is no longer any sea. However, it only, if only through the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we can gain salvation so that we are no longer condemned to live in a fallen world. Because we are broken people living in a broken world, the consequences of our brokenness is trials and suffering. God's ultimate plan in the redemption of humanity and the creation. Romans 8 verses, Romans chapter 8 verses 18 through 25 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. In the end, God will eliminate all suffering. Until then, however, trials and suffering is designed to enable us to reach that goal. Remember, since Jesus suffered too, he understands our situation. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 tells us, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Next slide. There are many verses in the Bible that talk about how Jesus felt compassion towards others. Jesus, every single time, it was always Jesus recognized the need and had compassion acted. Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 says, seeing the people he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Therefore, we must show compassion to those we are counseling. So there is a lot we can learn from studying how Jesus interacted with people. So the best way we can grow in compassion is to follow the examples that Jesus set for us. When we counsel people without showing compassion, the counselee can pick up on this. Therefore, our discipleship efforts towards them will not be <laughs> as effective. Somebody is suffering, can't just rushedly go through. It's like, hey, it's God. He's working good in your life. You just got to deal with it. Just wait for him to make all things new. You're good. That's not showing compassion. <laughs> when people who are suffering ask why they are suffering, they may be looking for comfort more than an explanation as to why they are suffering. Therefore, we must show them the love and compassion of Christ. In order to do that, we must consider the following. 
Do not coddle them. Do not tell them everything will be all right because you're lying. We must make sure that we ourselves are continuing to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Continuing to deal with the sin in our lives affects how we see and deal with the problems of others. Therefore, as counselors, we must continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. As such, it is important that we continue to work on crucifying the sin in our life. As we continue to be conformed to the image of Christ, it then changes how we see people. We are then able to look upon them with compassion and to seek and seek to help them walk in God's truth. I'm going to say that one more time. We are then able to look upon them with compassion and seek to help them walk in God's truth. One of the main reasons that we can look on other on others with compassion is because we have seen the truth of God's word applied to our life. Colossians chapter 3 verses 9 through 17 says, Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you, should you, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. With all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Putting on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience must start with dealing with the sin in our own lives. Then when you hear people's stories, you will naturally respond with a compassionate heart because you are seeing them the way that God sees them and your heart breaks for their situation. Remember, we are not different than the people we are discipling. Even though we may not have the exact same experiences as those we're counseling, we are still not very different from others. Even so, we must likely have had similar experiences as they have had. For example, we struggle with temptation, sin, devastation, suffering, difficulty, and the consequences of our own sin. In all these ways, we are the same and can relate to them. We have just experienced those things in a different way. Jesus himself shared our experiences here on earth. However, he was without sin. Remember, we are counseling an individual, not an issue. An important part of discipleship is being able to look at each person individually. When Jesus interacted with someone, he was able to focus in on that person's individ on that person individually. He was able to take the truth of God's word and apply it specifically to this individual and their specific situation. So the truth did not change, but the way he applied it did. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
as we allow the word of Christ to richly dwell within us, the way we see others is not just a problem to fix. Rather, the way we see others now is through the lens of scripture. In other words, we see others the way God sees them. This allows us to speak the truth strongly to them, but with grace, mercy, kindness, and tenderness, because now we are seeing not as man sees, we're seeing the person and their situation as God sees. We must not look at others as just a problem to fix. Where we learn certain counseling skills and follow a certain procedure and then think they are good to go. Rather, by following Jesus' examples and showing compassion towards them, we show them the truth of God's word so that they can drink from the well and be restored. Are there any questions? Amen. Thank you very, very much for attending. If there's no further questions, I will pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for trials and suffering. Thank you for how they grow us into the image of your son. Father, we know how your son suffered. And when he was on the cross, suffering even until death, he didn't say, this is too much. I can't do it. He was a perfect example for us. Father God, may you equip us and complete us with your word. May we treasure it in our hearts. May we seek the lost and dying to come alongside in any situation, in any way, shape, or form, to encourage, to instill hope, to lift up and to point other believers to you, Lord. You are the one who will grow us, that will get us and give us the strength to get through all of these issues. Father God, show us our life-dominating sins. Allow us to put off our old self. Be renewed in the spirits of our minds and put on christ like. May we capture that thought. May we be kind and tenderhearted, forgiving others as you have forgiven us in Christ. Bless our evening, Lord. Grow us, keep us, and strengthen us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.